the view of the Philippines from outside. How do you see the Philippines today? Well, you remember they were the tigers, the Southeast Asian tigers in the 90s, which 90s. is when I was here last time. Correct. Then there was the crisis, the Asian financial crisis, and they kind of fell off everybody's radar screen. Uh, not led by the Philippines, it was Thailand and Indonesia yes. that had the problems, but it dragged everybody else down. It was, yes. So then there was another, that was sort of like a lost decade. Yes. And now it seems to me there's sort of a comeback. Uh, an enlarged ASEAN, yep. uh, invigorated economically, and now coinciding with an American administration that seems to be paying more attention, attention. to Southeast We haven't had Asia. this much attention in a long time. Yeah, and I, I would thank uh, President Obama, of course, but I would also say that uh, Mrs. Clinton yeah, deserves Clinton. quite a bit of the credit for that. But you have a president who's disposed towards Asia. He grew up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, he spent years, he spent a number of years in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I think he probably understood, of all the foreign areas of the world, he understands Asia better than any other. So I think, think and, and uh, his speech before the Australian Parliament and the talk about shifting emphasis towards Asia, they, they use the word pivot, pivot but they've been pivot, backing pivot. off that yes. word lately. But, but the, the rebalancing, the greater focus on right. Asia, I think is real, yeah. it's genuine. And uh, some, I, I, some State Department officials have talked about um, enlarging you know, taking the VFA and moving it forward. Is that something that, that you see happening? I, I, you know, I don't know. I think that ought to, I, I would never want to try and force the pace on something like that. I think we've had too much history mm. in the bilateral relationship and- uh, It seems to be on both sides. Too frankly. much volatility and too many ups and downs. Yeah. It, you know, to me, there's a benefit to having a, an agreement that we're all comfortable with and that's sustainable yes. and that doesn't uh, tax the political system of either side. Um, you know, and if there's a need for more help, uh, it, you know, then perhaps that'll be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis of some kind. But certainly there's more interest mm -hmm. uh, in Southeast Asia uh, economically, politically, uh, and and militarily as well, from a security point of view. I mean, mm -hmm. After all, Southeast Asia remains important. You've got these sea lanes that yeah. go through here. Um, it's going to remain important for the foreseeable future. Last year, the Philippines was one of the best performing economies, um, mm -hmm. third in in the region, and then globally. I mean, second after China. I was surprised by that. That's surprising. Mm. Did that is that surprising? What do you see happening? Can this be sustained? Well, you've got a capable uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. You've got a, uh, uh, you know, in relative terms, a pretty good education system, although I'm sure that people can, can think of things that need to be um, uh, improved. There is entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit and a bit of, uh, you know, a, a history of uh, free enterprise in this country. I mean, it, it may be a mixed picture. Yes. There have been some in entities that have been nationalized and so on and so forth. But there is an entrepreneurial class uh, and an understanding of what it takes to make an economy grow. So there are a lot of positive factors mm -hmm. uh, out there, it seems to me. And operating now in a fairly positive environment. Look at all these economies around. You've got China's prosperity that is an engine of growth. You've got uh, Chinese entrepreneurs not only in the mainland of China, but greater China, I mean, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc. But China hit its lowest growth rate in 12 years last year. But they year. still, still buy a lot. They still right. invest. They yes, still, yes, yes. They still send tourists, uh, to my understanding. Correct. Our Travelers. largest. Yes, yes. Yeah. Even after the bus hostage in 2009. So mm -hmm. um, the region is, is expanded. The region is growing. Are we just the beneficiaries of the fact that you've got the Euro crisis going on and the U.S., um, the mature economy? No, I think there's a genuine shift. I think. I think the shift is that Asia is becoming a economic and demographic center. I mean, the, 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 the center of gravity of the world's population and economy has shifted towards Asia. That's a reality. And if you look out to, the, to 2050, for example, yes. I mean, just try to visualize what the economy the economies, say, of China, Japan, and uh, 
India, but particularly China and India, will represent. And yes. Indonesia, what, what happens when Indonesia really takes off? Which is, you know, you can't rule that out. Correct, correct. It's been waiting to happen. Technology. I mean, again, this is a period of time where technology seems to be, can be a disruptive force in it. What role do you see it playing uh, moving forward? Well, it's an enabler. I mean, technology, well, we all know it from the way we ourselves use technology. It makes an individual so much more capable of getting things done. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you can be a, a television station, a radio broadcaster, uh, a publisher, you know, all with just a few pieces of equipment and, and the the strength of your own imagination and wit. You're describing Rappler. No, yeah, well, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Of you, course. You must know of what course. I mean better than most. Yes. Uh, it, it's extraordinary how it empowers you. I, even I, as a, somebody who spent my whole life, really, my whole professional life working in large bureaucracies, mm -hmm sometimes just marvel at how much easier it is to get something done just with a few pieces of equipment and your own uh, capabilities. What do you think this will do? I mean, the decision makers, it, it seems we're straddling different worlds now. They're the digital uh, generation that's coming up, but the decision mm -hmm. makers are still getting used. They're not digital natives. They're, we're still getting used to this new Well, technology. I think what it, where, it, where it brings us is more empowered individuals, so people have richer and better, richer, I mean in the broadest sense of the world, Correct. enriched lives. Yes. And I think enriched societies as a result. You still need government, Yes. you still need organization, but you need it as a framework around which, uh, sort of just to give meets and bounds to, and limits to what this technology can do and where it can go. You have, you know, you have issues with technology that yes, have to do absolutely. with privacy and intellectual property and all the... SOPA in the States all the here, different cyber issues, crime, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, that, that we know about. Yes. So there, there is a place for governance, but it's not in owning the stuff Correct. or in telling it what to do other than telling, uh, other than deciding what the rules of the game are going to be. My last question is, is I yeah. know we've gone through the entire world, but what do you, if you were to choose the single biggest security threat in this right world now. today, yeah, what would you choose? Well, I worry, I worry about cyber. Um, and mm. for the following reason, uh, we have see, we've been seeing lately in the United States more and more of these different kinds of cyber attacks. They're yes. like... The Aramco, well, the Aramco is going There's a Aramco. Yeah. Well, that's a, an example, though. Stocks. And there have been efforts to attack banks, the yes. banking systems, where they basically get assaulted, yes. uh, deluged by cyber attacks. This is DDoS you're talking that's about. That's right. Distributed yeah. denial of service. Exactly. Anonymous. <laughs> Distributed denial of service, and which, what you know, if those become frequent enough, and heaven forbid, you know, too successful, what you could do is you could, at, at the very least, create some real drag right. on various economies, but you could also visualize the possibility, at least, someday of, an, of attacks that actually succeed in really crippling critical infrastructure. Right. So I think it's a defensive problem in the first instance. How do you defend yourself against right. these attacks? But then more broadly, how do you reach understandings, we come back again to our famous problems of diplomacy, with countries like China or Russia or ourselves right. uh, about how you're going to conduct, what's the, what are the international rules going right. to be so that we aren't all walking around worrying about uh, DDS attacks? Cyber war is something that, you That's know, what again, I'm what happened about. with Aramco or Stuxnet, is mm -hmm. this something that is already ongoing? I mean, are we seeing this now? Well, I think you've seen examples of it, yes. but it's not yet a generalized phenomenon. But I think those incidents that you refer to raise the the issue of you know what what are we going to do about that? Do yes. we do we need to think about some rules of the game here that prevent this from getting out of hand? Right, right. You know, it's, it's right now there are none, and no one is really held accountable really, for it. Not really. Not really. I mean, is it implementable? We, well, Do you get we've, been the in, we've been cooperating to some. The, the areas where I think there's more cooperation has to do with the more limited and definable 
uh, problems like uh, cyber crime, mm. uh, crime against the banking system, Correct. maybe some of the issues to do with intellectual property, pornography, you know, things like that. But the broader thing about, you know, hostile, aggressive cyber the, attacks. Well, the so DOS has attacked government websites all around the world right, with right. impunity. Right. I mean, Anonymous has done that. Okay. Last Interesting stuff. Fascinating. And it's strange how, um, sorry, my last. To Bataha Reef. I mean, you were asked this this morning. Uh, there well, was I was asked accident. at lunch today, and I pointed out that I have scuba dived at the Tubataha Reef. I was taken there by a very good friend of mine from Cebu, who unfortunately has died, Benson Dakai. But he was a big, uh, sure. a big scuba diver, and he I had a scuba he boat yeah. and a scuba ship. And we went off the Tubataha Reef one, one Holy Week, one yes. uh, Easter week and so I, I, I would have been very surprised if during the time I was scuba diving if I'd come to the surface and all of a sudden seen a minesweeper <laughs> sitting in front of me. So it is a bit of an anomalous uh, development and uh, I'm sure that the U.S. Navy at the moment feels very badly about this. They've apologized They about did apologize it. Sunday. They've yeah. apologized about yeah. it. It's very embarrassing, and obviously they didn't do it on purpose, and they certainly don't want to see it happen again. It's triggered all these conspiracy theories yeah, because, well, but the, well, you know, the, it's because the map wasn't the idea that the United States are very sophisticated. I know, as always. But um, but why would <laughs> I mean? That's why the would the question. commander of a vessel want to do this? Basically, <laughs> from a point of view of a career point of view, it's a suicidal thing to have happen to him. He's his career. Um, has been severely, if not irreparably, harmed by this act. Usually, naval officers to whom this happens, you know, they have to leave the command of their right. vessel and so forth. So, obviously, it wasn't done on purpose. Okay. Thank you. Any last words? I mean, we ran the whole world. Well, it's great to be back in the Philippines. And again, as I, uh, I, I, I've said, I, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the prospects for the Philippines. I think it's on the uptick. Mm -hmm. And I think interest in our own country is growing. And that's the reason that together with many Filipino friends, we formed this U.S. United States Philippine Society. Fantastic. It's good to have you back. Good. Thank you. Um, we've been speaking with Ambassador John Negroponte. He is in the Philippines until Saturday. Talk Thursday. Is, um, please go ahead and send your comments on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm Maria Ressa. Thanks for joining us.